Uh, this is a, an introduction that I wanted to give. And I wanna just tell you a little bit about the founding of the Rocky Mountain Map Society. In 1991, I went to a meeting at the Library of Congress uh, that was the International Map Collector Society there. And for the first time, as a lonely map collector who didn't even know there was such a thing as map collecting, uh, I heard lecture after lecture after lecture throughout the day on maps and was just thrilled. And I came back to Denver and thought, we have to have a society. And so I went to our one map dealer, Paul Mahoney, and said, I want to start a map society. Could I use your mailing list? Because he had a catalog list to reach out to people. And he said, yes. And they said, but if you're going to start a map society, you got to meet this guy named Dr. Don McGurk. And so I called Don up and we got together and together drafted the materials and had the first organizational meeting. And that was in the fall of 1991. And we've been going strong ever since. So this man, Dr. Don McGurk, is truly co-founder of our society. I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about the good doctor. He is a retired pediatrician with the Kaiser system, much loved by them. If you talk to other people at Kaiser, uh, they'll tell you how highly regarded he was for many, many years. And a long time ago, he fell into to the love of early world maps, the earliest things. I mean, he's into the really cool stuff and really expensive. And he built a very large collection of magnificent early world maps and then decided after he had cornered the market to sell off those maps at a great profit. Uh, and he moved on to other subjects, many other subjects. And each time he became a great expert in that field, the Sea of the West, and now mapping the, the uh, territory in that state of Missouri. Uh, and, but his real love is the thing that we're gonna be talking about tonight. He has been focusing for decades on these subtle complexities and has created truly pioneering work. In fact, at the Library of Congress, he presented a precursor, an earlier version of the paper we're gonna to hear tonight uh, in 2017 at a conference on the Baltimore map. Uh, but he has made many improvements and refinements He's been challenged uh, and has had to rebut those challenges. And so now he's saved the very best for the Rocky Mountain Map Society, his true love. And he's come all the way back from Kansas City to be with us in person tonight. So please help me in welcoming our friend, Dr. Don McGregor. Thank you, Wes. That was quite an introduction. You took a lot of time on my talk. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's so nice to be back here and see so many friends in the audience and so many friends on the internet too. Thank you very much for showing up for this talk. Uh, this is gonna be a little tricky because the, sli the slides that I can see are smaller than I'd hope and I have to read some stuff for the slide. So in some instances, I might actually ask you to read it for me or just to yourself. So I'm gonna turn a little bit away from the audience so I can see this, the large screen a little bit better. My apologies to the audience. Okay, and is the mic still working okay? Yes. All right, and so why are we here tonight? Oh, the new Quaker is working pretty well. Is this North America? Well, it, it may be, but that we're going to discuss that. In uh, the 1970s, this uh, question was uh, put in a, uh, a book, and re the reply was, this is perhaps the greatest unsolved cartographic puzzle of the period. So in the 70s, this was still a big puzzle. A lot of people felt very strongly that this was North America. And here's the Walsam mm -hmm. I'm right next to it. Here's the, here's the, here's the Walser Mueller map, 1516. It's in the J. Kislak collection in the Library of Congress. Beautiful, huge map. You, it's on display in the, in the Jefferson building if you want to go see it. And on this uh, map, 
there's this geography that I just showed you on the previous slide. And you will notice that is directly across from Spain. So certainly it's continental size and it's certainly uh, just west of Spain. So certainly that would suggest that this is North America, no question about it. Here's the Walsh Meal in 1507. And again, you can see the same geography on the 1507, although it looks a little different because of the projection, but it's, it's the same geography with the same place names on, on the continent. So let's compare these two because they're not identical. The 1507 map does not name the continent. The, uh, what I have highlighted in yellow there just says beyond this point, we don't know what exists. So, and on this map, uh, what uh, just below what might be the tip of Florida, there is an island named Isabella. Now, if you go over to the 1516, the continent is named but it doesn't say North America, it says Terra de Cuba, part of Asia. So the land of Cuba and part of Asia. Also, the island of Isabella isn't named at all. And why this is the case, we'll talk about just a little bit later. So this magnificent map, 1502, Antino map, beautiful map. It's the first map of a whole uh, collection of maps that show the geography that I just showed you. And uh, Henry Harris called these Lusitano-Germanic maps. So this is one, and there's our landmass. It looks a little cut off because it was cut off. The left side of that map was cut off at one point, but that's a topic for another presentation. So here's the Cantino 1502. The next map to show it was the Caverity of uh, 1504, and then the Walsamula that we've already showed you. And this is also pictured on the Roish map, although on the Roish map, it's sunk down to rather a large island rather than a continent, but it's, it's the same geography and has the same place name, so we know it's the same. So here we have North America on the left and our Cantino uh, on uh, uh, Carta America. Uh, the 1516 uh, Walsh Mueller on the right. And you can see it kind of looks just right, doesn't it? I mean, it, it just looks right. And so it's no surprise that most people thought that this, this was North America. Here's another map. And I would suggest to you that this map looks even more like North America than the Walsh Mueller. Here we have Cape Cod. Here we have the east coast of North America. Here we have a perfect Florida, a Gulf of Mexico, and even the Yucatan Peninsula. So you've got to admit that that looks really like North America. But the problem is the date of the map that's shown on. From our map of 1448. And here's that geography. And you can see that it's uh, southwest of Spain. Now, you might say, well, maybe there were explorers that early that did coast this uh, geography, and it really is North America. Well, the problem with that is that the cities on the map are the Chinese cities, so probably not North America. So this is just a cautionary note. Just because something looks right on an old map isn't necessarily so. So, in, uh, in 1972, most historians thought that this was North America, but there were some people that had a, a minority opinion, and their minority opinion was this was Columbus's Cuba. Kind of big for Cuba, but that was the thought. And here's a name of some of those individuals uh, that very early thought that this was Columbus's Cuba and not North America, and there's some heavy hitters here. If you look at these names, uh, Henry, uh, Henry Stevens, uh, Norgan Skoll, uh, uh, Henry Beno, these are these are big names in the history of maps, and it was their opinion. The problem was that they really didn't go into a lot of explanations as to why that thought that way. The gentleman at the bottom, uh, George Dunn, 
was the person that did the most on this. And he sort of scratched the surface, but didn't get into real deep, but he had some arguments as to why. Well, most of the others had, the, had an opinion. There were some uh, later people, uh, for instance, in uh, 1988, a very obscure pediatrician gave a paper uh, that no one heard. Uh, that's not true. I'm not being fair to SHD. Uh, and uh, a couple of uh, decades later, there was a better known map collector who also believed in this minority opinion. So what are we gonna do? How are we gonna prove this? Well, let me postulate, let's do this. Let's pretend we are map makers. And it's 1504, 1510, 1511, in there. And we're going to collect all the information we could get our hands on to try and see what that might be. So instead of just making assumptions, we're going to use the information uh, that we can get to test the minority opinion that this is not North America, but rather Cuba. So, uh, so the, the items that we've collected are amazing. They were almost impossible to get, but uh, via history, we can get them now. And so those three pieces of information are, first, Columbus's log of his first voyage, a gentleman by Las Casas was nice enough to make a copy of a copy, and now we have that. So that's great. All sorts of information. Uh, Columbus is writing this stuff down while he's traveling on his first voyage. That's amazing stuff, and we were lucky to get it. The second piece of information we were able to get is called the Libro Cobriador, and that's a collection of nine letters written from Columbus to the king and queen of Spain. This is really hard stuff to get. As a matter of fact, before 1985, you couldn't get it. That's when it was first published. And finally, a, a gentleman named per, uh, Perez de Luna gave testimony. And what testimony? Well, testimony must mean a lawsuit. And yes, it was a lawsuit. It was a lawsuit between the family of Columbus and the king and queen of Spain, because the family of Columbus felt that they, uh, the king and queen of Spain owned Columbus and his family, all sorts of islands and all sorts of uh, recompense. Uh, and you, as you can imagine, the king and queen of Spain said, well, maybe not. So that went on for decades. And again, that's for another story for another time. Uh, okay, from these works, we're gonna seek the following information. The shape of Columbus is Cuba, the size of Columbus is Cuba, and the relationship between Columbus is Cuba with an island called Isabella, which we just pointed out earlier. So first let's talk about the shape of Columbus is Cuba. And uh, from letter four of the Libra Cooperator, we learn the following information. These coasts run to the west, the one treading away from the Ar Ar Arctic and the other towards it. And, and I'm sorry if I'm, I have to read the slides and uh, my reading glasses aren't as good as they should be, so. Uh, which begins narrow and widens up as uh, one, uh, I'm sorry, I can't read it. Proceeds. Proceeds, thank you. Much like this, uh, the sale of a lantine rigged caramel. Now, I didn't know what a lantine rig caravel or a lantine uh, a sail looked like, and probably most of you don't. So here's a picture of one. And here's our picture of the 1516 Walsamiller. And you can see, well, you know, it kind of looks like that. All right, well, let's find another piece of information. Perez de Luna in his testimonial. The said Cuba is shaped like a triangle, and he uses the term ungoron. Uh, and my apologies to Spanish-speaking people because I'm sure I've totally butchered that, extending from the east to the west. And the point is at the eastern part. And again, most of you probably don't want, know what an ungoron is, so here's a picture. It's defined as half of a quarter of a shield. So, but that's what it looks like. 
right. and again, uh, our 15, 16 map kind of looks like it. So uh, if we take these two and put it together and make a map, it might look something like this. This is a starting map. So this is sort of what Cuba looks like. Okay, the size of uh, Columbus is Cuba. Well, that's important to know how far north does it go and how far south does uh, Columbus is Cuba go. So, uh, so this is uh, on the northern coast, information it says about the northern coast. From Columbus's uh, diario is long. I am uh, distance from the equator line, 42 degrees towards the north side. So what he's saying is I'm at 42 degrees north latitude. Well, that's amazing. You know exactly where to put the north of uh, uh, Columbus's Cuba on the map. And just to make sure that we understand him clearly, on November 21st, he says, I was, uh, I was 42 degrees north of the equatorial line. So that's interesting. Does anyone recognize this edifice? It's Plymouth Rock. Now you know, and I know, that he never got to Plymouth, Massachusetts. But you weren't on the ship with them, and this is directly from Columbus. So that's where you're going to put your northern extent of Columbus's Cuba. But wait. From letter one of the Libro Cobrador, he adds, he traveled the, the north coast of uh, the north shore of uh, Cuba and the uh, northwestern uh, region still lay before me at least another 50 to 60 leagues. That's about 150 to 180 leagues. He's saying, I can see 150 to 180 leagues further north and there's still coastline there. Well, that's pretty hard to do too. And I would suggest to you, the only way he might say that is he's got something in the back of his mind. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So if you go that far north, you're seeing signs that say, welcome to Canada. And we know we didn't get here. Okay. How about the Southeast extent? And this gets a little bit trickier and the typing gets a little smaller. So <laughs> let me do the best I can here. So letter two of the Libra Copia. Here at La Isabella. Now La Isabella at this point is a city on the island of Hispaniola. We are more than 26 degrees from the equatorial line. So he's basically saying we're 26 degrees north latitude. And to sort of give you a, a point of reference, that's a few degrees north of the Tropic of Cancer. In letter four of Lee Recovery, he says, and I sailed west along the southern shore of Cuba, 322 leagues. And then when I got to see where it turned south, I turned back. So he's saying, I went a thousand miles along the coast of Cuba, which is a gross exaggeration. And then it turned south, so I didn't want to go any further. I just turned back. So now we uh, can make a sketch map with some more additional information. And now our sketch map probably looks a little something like this. And again, looking kind of the same. All right. And that's where the... Uh, Books turn south right there. All right. Returning uh, to the shape of Columbus's Cuba, De Luna discussing Cuba states, and he and he Columbus pronounced this to be continental land by its shape. Now, does that make any sense to anyone out there? Well, it does if he's got something in the back of his mind. So, could it be that he was expecting to see just that sort of geography on the coast of Asia or China? Maybe that was in the back of his mind and why this was all, to me, that's the way it only make, it makes sense. And so, is there something along the coast of Asia that might look something like that? Yes, there it is. Okay, so here's images of the east coast of Asia of, from circa 1490. Yomar Tellus, 1491, there's one image of it, and here's a second image of it. 
and the Bayham Glow, 1492, uh, Western Hemisphere, and then a close-up. Now, there's a triangle shape. Peninsula of Asia, and if you go over to the Bahame Globe, there's the same sort of peninsula that looks a little bit like our map, and it's right on the Tropic of Cancer. Also, you know, 1516, Bahame Globe. Oops, sorry, got a butterfinger there. So, Basically, you can see that in some of them, again, okay, something didn't show up that was supposed to be there. That's why I wanted to run through these before and didn't get a chance to. So let me point this out then. Uh, it, at the very tip of the, uh, where the red arrow is on the right, it says Zaytun, and a little bit further, it says Quincey right along the uh, top of the cancer. And to the north, it says, and say, and hopefully it'll show up in this next one. No, it does not. Okay. Well, let's, let's move on. Okay, so this Asian Peninsula is the Manji Peninsula. And how do we know that? Columbus is uh, November 1st, 1492. He says, uh, so he's coasting, he's coasting the North Shore of Cuba at this point. And he's trying to figure out where he was. And he says, uh, that this is, uh, and, that I am at Seiton and Quince, the two names that I just mentioned to you. So here we go. So here we have again, say him glow, there's Quince, and there's Seiton, and that's where uh, Quince is supposed to be. And now here, this is a better example. This is the Toscanelli map, or a recreation of the Toscanelli map. Toscanelli sent, a letter to uh, Columbus and also sent him a map of what he thought he was going to run into when he got to China or, or the west coast of Asia. And here's Quince and here's Zaytun. And Columbus thought he was halfway between those two. So this uh, uh, peninsula is the Manji Peninsula. And that's what he was expecting. That's what he was told he was going to see. That's what he thought he was going to see. And when he saw Cuba, he equated it to this geography. So, so one could ask, well, well maybe you, you're making that up. Maybe he didn't see any world maps. Maybe, maybe he didn't see any globes. Well, on October 24th of 1492, he says, and uh, talking about the location of Japan, he says, and in these, uh, in the spheres that I saw, and in the world maps, it is uh, in this general region. Here's our Bahame globe. Here's the Manji Peninsula, and there's Japan. So he states that he has seen glo globes, he has seen maps, and he knows about this Manji Peninsula, and he's named several uh, cities that live, that are on those that peninsula. So, let's talk a little bit now about the relationship between Columbus's Columbus's Cuba and the island of Isabella, because this sort of all ties in. So Columbus came to seek the land of the said Cuba nearest to the island of Isabella. Well, we've seen that on our map, right? Okay, so that makes sense. Well, it really doesn't, because Columbus says uh, that the closest, so De Luna says the closest island is Isabella, but Columbus said Hispaniola was the island closest to Cuba. So now we've got a problem. There's, you know, there's some controversy here. So let's see if we can dispel that. 
My sense is there are two possibilities here. Lunar or Columbus renames uh, Hispaniola Isabella, or there's another island, and that island, Isabella, is closest to Cuba than Hispaniola. And there is an answer to, an answer to this, and it's in letter two and letter four of the Libro Copia book. And within this uh, letter, he says, he uses the term Isabella 15 times when discussing Hispaniola. So Columbus is renamed Hispaniola, Isabella, on his second. Now, why would he do that? Well, because Isabella was a big deal. I mean, she pushed for him, him to uh, be able to have his voyages. And so he names everything Isabella. There's act, so there's the city of Isabella that we talked about. And he wrote one letter where he says, I'm writing this from Isabella on Isabella. So both the islands, so there's an island and this, a city on that island, both called Isabella. And when he was going through the Bahamas on his first voyage, he also named the Bahama Island Isabella. So when you're trying to read about Isabella in early writings, it can be very confusing sometimes. And this was a, a big sticking point for a lot of people before this was all figured out. And certainly the Libra Coviador helped to do that. Okay. So it's Columbus who renames Hispaniola Isabella. Well, uh, is there any further proof? Maybe, maybe that's not quite enough. Do you need something else? Well, there is further proof. And it's in some images that we have from books, particularly books from Marco Polo. And this specific one is uh, a picture from a, a book of Isabella, uh, a book of Marco Polo. And you can see it, the title of the book right there. And it was printed in Seville in 1503. And in the middle, there's two cities named. And I'll give you a close up. And the city on the left said Santa Domingo on the island of Isabella. And the other one is Calais. So if we can find out where Santo Domingo was, then we'll know which island he's talking about. Well, here's a modern picture of Hispaniola, also known as Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And here's Santo Domingo. And Santo Domingo was first uh, founded by uh, Bartholomew Columbus in 1496. So yeah, Isabella is Hispaniola. It's been renamed. Okay, so if you understand that Hispaniola is really Isabella, then your early world maps are gonna look like this. The King Hammy map, Cuba, Isabella. The Maggioli map of 1511, Cuba, Isabella. Leonardo da Vinci map, Cuba, Isabella. Uh, Maggioli, Naples, 1516, Cuba, Isabella. Looking a lot like Hispaniola. Um, so if you don't understand this, then your sketch map looks like this. An unknown continent, an island named Isabella, and then an island named Hispaniola or Spaniola in this case. And interestingly enough, this is a 1513 Walser Miller map, which is sort of in between the, this, this depiction and those three maps changes a little each time. There are a couple of, there are a couple of other maps that also uh, would suggest that this continental landmass is Cuba. And we're only gonna talk about two of them, the Roish map, the Perry Reese map. So here's the Roish map, and here's a close-up of the, the continental landmass, now sort of a very large island rather than a continent. But we know it's the same because there's place names on it that say just that. And here's our uh, Hispaniola, and here's a real close-up, and we'll get to that in a second. So one of the name, place names on here is Cape of the End of April, and I'm, we'll get to that a little bit later. But it, this little area that I just highlighted, you can see that there was something there. Now, how does that happen? Well, not infrequently, they did a plate, and then they decided there was geography that's wrong on that plate. So they beat the old geography out and then put new geography on top of it. And that's just exactly what's happened here. 
And if you look real closely, you can see that it says to Cuba. Now, some of the uh, older books would say, yeah, on the Roy map, he forgot to put Cuba. No, he didn't forget, he put it twice. Once as a, once as a smaller island and then one as a bigger island with, with oh, sorry, with Spaniola next to it. So Perry Reese, Perry Reese, Perry Reese map. And uh, Greg McIntosh has done, has done a lot of work on this and he was kind enough to translate the Arabic into Spanish. And so here we have Cuba, here we have Porto Grande, which becomes very important in a little bit. Here we have Hispaniola right next to Cuba. Here we have Navidad, a little small fort that they put. It's the first fort in the new world. And here we have our peninsula. So uh, we have Cuba and Hispaniola. Okay. So I want to talk about some of the place names. There are 23 or 22, depending on which map you're talking about. But if you think about it, if this was Columbus's Cuba, wouldn't some of the place names reflect things that might have happened while he was on his first and second voyage? First voyage north shore of Cuba, second voyage south shore of Cuba. So if we're going to do a little digging here and see what we can find. And the one that really sort of nails it is Cape of the End of April. Cape of the End, end of April would certainly suggest that on April 30th, or maybe 29th, but April 30th, the last day of April, whoever was discovering this continental landmass or Cuba would have named a cape with that name. So let's see if we can find that. Cape of the end of April. So here it is on the uh, 1507 Waltz Mueller. There's Isabella. So no one less than Henry Harris has said that there was no way that this name could be associated with Cuba or Columbus. He said it very emphatically, I'll let you read his, the direct quote there, but he was convinced that that was the case. And I would suggest to you that we should test Teresa's assertions. So Libro Covida, letter four, again, this is eight, uh, 1985 and on. So we've got a real jump on the, the earlier historians. On April 30th, uh, he reached, uh, this is on his, well, let me explain. On his first voyage, uh, he is coasting the north shore of Cuba towards the east, okay? And he says, and I, uh, I I reached the Cape Alpha and Omega. Now that's the very tip. That place name Alpha and Omega doesn't last very long. It becomes Cape Maisi very quickly. Uh, so coming to that coast. And I sailed west along the southern coast as far as the uh, port of uh, named uh, Grande. I'm sorry, we're talking about the south coast now. So he's, he's sailing the coast, the south coast of Cuba. Okay, so here's Punta Ma here's uh, Punta Maesi. These two points define Cape Maesi, and he sails all the way to Porta Grande. You might know that as Guantanamo Bay. He sails this whole coast on April thirtieth. Well, interesting enough, there's another cape there. 
it's it's not named in most maps, but it's definitely uh, a cape. So uh, in, in, in 1492, now he's on the north coast and he's sailing towards Hispaniola. So he's going west to east. And as he gets to the end of uh, Cuba and on his way, he says this, that one passed Cabo Maese. He saw that the coast turned south and trended southwest. And he soon saw a handsome and high cape in the same direction. And it was distance from the first one, Cabo Maese, seven leagues. So, about, okay, so here are two points that define Cabo Maese. Here's Guantanamo or Puerto Grande. And these two points are our cape. So, is it a handsome and high cape, I guess? Oh, I was saying that on some 19th century maps of Cuba, they call it Cabo Bueno. And Bueno and Hermoso both can be defined as fine, a fine cape. So that might be a little bit of a history, uh, but that's not totally telling. So let's do this. Here's a picture of Cabo Maiz, and it's uh, north facing south, and uh, the very tip is right there. And you can see the road, uh, uh, vertical road there. And so if we turn to the west, so now our road is at the bottom. And if you look way down, and I'm sorry this picture isn't any better, but it's the best I could get, you see a very high cape, it's about 21 miles away. And here's a picture at the top of that cape, looking back towards Maese, Cabo, Cabo Maese. And um, it looks like it's kind of high up, doesn't it? Looking down. And if you go to Google World, it tells you that this cape is actually 405 feet tall and it's right on the cape. So it certainly is high and it looks kind of pretty. I don't know if you can call it Hermosa, but it looks kind of pretty. So anyway, so back to the Kaveri map. And there's the name, uh, point of the uh, Cape of the end of April. And here's my EC. Here's the Cape we're talking about. And then there's Guantanamo Bay. So uh, there are six other uh, place names that match. And, and I take, uh, we'll do these more quickly because they're fairly straightforward. So, High coast. Now, this is a problem if you want to make this geography the southeast coast of the United States, because there are no high coasts there. I think the highest point at some point was 114 feet, and that was it. So it's problematic uh, to those who wanted to make this North America. Okay, in the Diario on October 28th, on his first voyage, he says, and all this land is alta, high, like Sicily. Oh, okay, well, let's match that up. Here's an image of Sicily with a high coast. And here's the image of the north coast of Cuba with a high coast. Next one, uh, co uh, coast of the ocean sea. Does anyone remember what Columbus's uh, title was when he returned? Admiral of the Ocean Sea. And there's Samuel L. Morrison's uh, 1942 uh, book on Columbus, and he titles it Admiral of the Ocean Sea. Uh, and where does this come from? It's Marco Polo. Marco Polo uses the term Ocean Sea a number of times in his travel to uh, talk about the collective seas around Asia. The goats, la cabras. Now, this is an interesting because Columbus himself on the same voyage, it says, I have seen no goats. So it really can't be goats. Could it be something else? Well, I have a suggestion. I think it's abras. And abras has become cabras because 
no one knew what Abras meant. If you were a scribe, just doing a, a, your fifth map of the day and you saw Abras, so that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I think they switched to the Kabras. So Columbus has used the term Abra twice uh, on his sailing of, 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 of the coast and on those two days. And in each case, he was referring to a open, uh, an opening to the sea between mountains. And that's done in Kelly's translation of Abras. And here's a picture of one of them. Mountains with an opening to the sea. River with the dugouts. So uh, in Columbus's log, he uses the uh, term Abra or Abras 24 times when referring to the vessels of the natives. One example on November 1st, 1492 matches up very nicely. More than 16 dugouts, Amadeus came to the ship and the river I was in is very deep, river of the Almadias. Okay. River of the Crow or Crow River. Now, again, from the Libro Copido, we find out that he was along the South Coast and he said, I saw more than a million Pomerantes, Cuervos, Marinos, and I'd never seen such a sight. And he, and he was spellbound. And he reports it as a wonder. And my sense is this would make good sense for the river of the crows. Uh, and finally, river of the palms. And again, in the Libra Copiador, something we have that they didn't have before uh, 1985. Okay. Uh, I lingered on this coast searching for some fresh water, which I found in some spectacular palm groves. So he found his water uh, from a river in a grove, and that's River of the Palms. So these seven place names match up very well with what we've been talking about, as do the Spanish flags. Most people don't talk about these. It suggests these were discoveries for the king and queen of Spain, not just anybody, but for the king and queen of Spain. So, well, Columbus was doing most of that in the early days. Okay. So to review, the information we've provided matches the shape of Columbus's Cuba or the landmass, the size of the uh, Columbus's Cuba or the Northwest landmass, the position of the landmass uh, in association with the island Isabella, and uh, uh, the maps uh, and match the place names, I'm sorry, that we've reviewed. So hopefully this presentation has convinced you that the Northwest landmass is uh, Cuba, uh, Columbus is Cuba and not North America. And what Paviani said was Columbus is erroneous opinion of reality. And he certainly did stretch reality, didn't he? So, and if it does so, I'm sure that Columbus would be very pleased. <laughs> Thank you for your kind attention, and I'm sorry for the distractions. Yeah. Well, yes. So uh, basically, uh, why does this matter? It sums it up. And I think part of it, some of us are just uh, love to create or, or to solve puzzles. And that was a good big part of it. And, and again, when, when someone says, this is one of the greatest puzzles of the time, and some people say, well, maybe we could figure that out. So, but yeah, I, I think it is important because when you have other people saying things that it just looks right, but well, and is there any more than that? And they, they see, no, there isn't. Uh, there have been some people that have, have presented papers that I've been at uh, that haven't been published that really don't have any answers. They just have more questions. So um, I think it is important to try and get history right. And that's why I dug into it. But yeah, as far as commercial and things like that, no. No, I meant for, for what are the implications for historians of discovery? In other words, might this have influenced subsequent? Oh, might have. Um, 
I'm not sure. Again, these maps didn't get huge circulations. And so I no, I don't think it would have uh, implications in, into other. They were all just trying to get over there as quick as they could and get as much as they could. And so, yeah, I'm sorry that I can't answer it better than that, but yes. It was the uh, wall simulator map of was 1513? 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, Three or two islands as well. Yeah. As a, so they had his. his uh, I'll, for the, uh, yeah. He, uh, <laughs> Chris is pointing at Chris is pointing out that there were two Isabellas, and, and I love that about that map, and that's why particular to just show how screwed up it all was. But couldn't one have been Hispaniola, which was said Hispaniola? Well, you could, and then the next one said Isabella. Yeah. If that was Cuba. Then the third one, which is the land mass, would have been North America. So that had three islands. Most of the maps you saw just had Isabella and then the land mass. Right. This one had well, Isabella, it had Hispaniola, Isabella, and then the land mass. So that means yeah, that's if, if Isabella. If you're, going, if you're going from left to right, it was the land mass, then Isabella, then Isabella. Then Hispaniola. <laughs> but I think that one was the one that had two Isabellas. Well, we we can talk about that. I'll I'll bring it up after the after the talk. I'll bring it up. Yes. I think it's worth remembering, isn't it, that these people were just as confused as modern scholars are. Yeah. They were making these maps. By which I mean, they were making them for the first time. They didn't have Google Maps to reference, to check them out, which explains why. I mean, when you say, "Well, was this North America or was it Cuba?" That's not the question. The question is, where did they think it from? Well, and they might, they might just as easily have been wrong as, as we are. Yeah, I, I don't know how to sum that up for the uh, uh, the well, our other so audience, like, but it's obvious when you say things like, "Well, here they made a, a, a coastline that looks a lot like North America," but then they they put these names of Chinese cities right. along it. Right. Well, that's an obvious mistake in cartography to say Columbus made. Right. All these cartographers. Oh, sure. They oh, sure. Have, they, have they, 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 you, you hit the nail on the head. Yes. Right. So the, the, this information was hard to get and confusing. And there's also a political thing going on where Portugal's trying to get some stuff and Spain's trying to get some stuff and England's trying to get some stuff. So yes, it's, it's very confusing. And there are, are, are multiple uh, people interested in multiple things. And again, we were very lucky. There's no way that they're gonna have all this information. They're, they're, they just have bits and drafts. And they're most of the time just copying from somebody else who had bits and drafts. Uh, my, my main point is that this giving a talk about what well, was this land mass X or was it Y? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But I, I, but I think, uh, but I think it's, I think it's important that if there's information, this it may not be the end all. I've never had a response to all of this, I, and I would be glad to receive it because it points out the weaknesses of this presentation. But uh, I do think there, there's enough information that I presented tonight to strongly suggest that it's not North America. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I understood that my memory might be wrong. That at a certain moment, uh, Columbus was stripped from his titles, uh, deep handed up for the yeah. violent prison. Right. Despite that, I understood he never recanted that uh, discovery. I believe that's correct. There are some people that said he did, but I don't believe so. I think he always thought he was. In China, and and uh, you know, and, and and to point out the obvious, he never put a foot on North American soil. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, first, I thought it was a great talk. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, I've been a member of this group for years, but the only person who knows I remember is West. <laughs> <laughs> because he gets a check from you. Like every family, my kids make fun of their parents and they make fun of me. And they, all well, for years, make fun of my parents. 
participating in the Rocky Mountain Nail Society. Huh. The irony is that three of the four are now members of the Rocky <laughs> All right. Thank you for their contribution, Wes. Thanks you very much. About 12 years ago, my son, who's much younger than a young adult now, asked, can you tell us one single thing you've learned from the Rocky Mountain Nail Society that is thought-provoking or interesting? And I thought, I can because we are Colorado Center and we are mountain center and we are west I said I realized that the history of man's learned from spray crew is driven by people by on waterways. And if you follow the rivers and the creeks, that's how you build a map. You build it from the outside and inward. Right. That's what I right. now the reason that your talk is so great is it's like a negative of the photograph of what I've learned about how to create maps because <laughs> Instead of starting in the center of Colorado or the American West and try to go outward, in fact, you're actually coming at it from the coast as discovering geography from the ocean, which is very interesting. Well, but that's what the early explorers did. You know, one thing that I didn't point out so on these. I briefly oh. And, and uh, I think only the thought that because over the holidays, I got a book from a young woman with whom I work. She said, I bet you'd like this. And it's called 50 Ships That Have Changed the Course of History. And I thought yeah. it sounds dry, but in fact, it's basically the map of the world by all the ships. And this is just an incredible plan. I will, I will try to summarize. So uh, the bottom line was it's interesting that you're discovering from the shore inward rather than uh, where we live outward. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but the, uh, I would like to mention, you know, that looks like a pretty good sized continent. I mean, to put the place names there, they needed, they needed to book blank space. This coastline was the, the deepest they ever got into it was maybe a mile. And so it's, it's really not a continent. And the only reason all that extra space is put there as a continent is just so they can get the place names on it. Yes. Um, it seems to me that the names are all like descriptions. Exactly. Well, and, and yes, it is. And it, it said it was made. It was the question was. It seems like they're all like places you would go or you'd find, like a like a lake or or a cape or a, you know adjectives. Yeah, like a Hyde Cape. Yes, yes, there, there, there's, there's a couple of books, and I, sh I should have brought one with me, but there are several books that go into the Te Tainos very deeply with, with their language and what the words meant, and they, they label the, all, the, all the islands in the Bahamas and the uh, seas around them. And uh, so, yes, they knew a lot, but unfortunately, we know that, but we don't know. The Columbus, Columbus, you, yes, Columbus used them to try and get to where the next island was. They would point, but he, and he also he also kidnaps he also kidnaps several of them so that they can learn Spanish. They can learn they can learn Spanish so that when he comes back, he has a translator. He actually adopted one of them as his own son. Yeah. Yes, way in back. That's a good. That's a good point. So the question is, how did he discover Asia without discovering Japan? And he, he, he wasn't sure where it was. Uh, on one map, uh, uh, several years later, they, and I can't remember whether it was, I think it was Hispaniola, they said, this must be Japan for that very reason. But he doesn't bring it up. He, he knows it's in the area. Maybe I just missed it. Maybe it was too far north, maybe it was too far south. But, but that's, I think that's a very good question. And um, he never finds Japan, but on some of the later maps by other cartographers, they do mention that this is this month. It, it doesn't say this is Japan. It says this must be Japan. 
the microphone seems to cut out. Yes, and, and it, it and it's cutting out even though I'm not even moving. I'm, I'm literally trying to stay. Oh, if you hold it. Okay, I've been told. No. <laughs> well, I. Okay. We'll we'll try it this way. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's all new. It's all It's it's my fault. Sure, blame me. <laughs> Yes. And um, and they took years to draw on things like that, as well as just the just the information from Columbus coming back, the explorer. How did that information get disseminated it, to the map? As little as, as little as possible. As little as possible. Yes. Right. So so it was being what stolen from somebody. Probably. You know, and distributed. Right. Or somewhere. did get, you could get bits and so the question was. How how did how did they get this information? Uh, and, and I think the answer is any way they could, either nefariously or legally. And and I'm sure that it came in drips and 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 some people made things up and then that got included. And then later on, someone said, "Oh, we now know that that's garbage." And so yeah, yeah. It's actually pretty amazing that they're as accurate as, as they are. In some, you, in some places, yes, you can yeah. say that. Yes. Yes. I, I have somewhat stands with a question of ignorance in front of a lot of experts. Well, you're talking to some. I'm just <laughs> like that, so go ahead. How does Amerigo Vespucci and the term America come into play? Okay, well, that, that's, that's after yes. America. Well, because he uh, got to South America first, or maybe not. Some people think that maybe it should have been Columbia because Columbus was there too. But uh, uh, he put uh, my senses, and again, that's a little off the topic, but my sense is he was the first one to write a book about his travels. And so uh, America, it became America. As a matter of fact, in the 1507, also in America, I don't know if you saw, he has, there's a picture of him on the right hand at the top. So yeah, and he was he was the one also he was the one that said I've discovered a new world. Columbus said I've discovered another world. Well, another world isn't as catchy as new world, so new world caught on. Yeah. Better PR. He had better PR. Better PR, absolutely. <laughs> Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, thank. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure on that. I, I will pass on that. Anyone in the audience have an answer for that question? <laughs> Don't know. Thank you so much. Everyone uh, out there in the E-land, thank you so much. I really appreciate you tuning in. And hi to all my friends that are out there and still listening. Thank you very much. <laughs>